Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Okay, welcome back to the Ancient Christian Writer series after a rather lengthy hiatus uh, due to illness, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, get moving again here through the rest of the summer. We're picking up with uh, our reading of St. John Cassian's conferences, and we're moving into the second part of the work. Uh, if you remember, it's thought that the first ten conferences uh, stand alone, and that maybe this it was his intention only to write those ten, uh, concluding with the two beautiful conferences on prayer, and that the, those that follow are kind of fleshing out of the spirituality of the desert. Uh, in any case, the, the conferences that we're going to be looking at are quite beautiful. The one tonight is Conference 11 on perfection or on perfect love. And, um, and then the one that follows this is on chastity. And there are two, two are intimately linked together. Chastity, in particular, uh, really has a, uh, an enormous place in Cassian's writing. Uh, it's the longest uh, the amount of writing, or it's the largest amount of writing on one subject next to prayer in, in the entire book. And it's because it's seen as sort of the, the essential virtue in the spiritual life that deepens our capacity to love. And so uh, it's understandable that then he moves from this, the perfection of love, what that would look like for us as human beings, as the grace of God perfects us, in then to ch chastity, the, the sort of the uh, perfect ordering of love uh, within our life and how this then is connected to all the other virtues. Really, chastity for Cassian is at the center of the ascetical life. And so it's going to give us a different perspective, I think, than certainly what modern culture emphasizes, that for Cassian, this is where we really have to invest ourselves fully as well as open ourselves up to the power of God's grace. We have to be fully immersed in the ascetic life, but also humble in the, in the face of something that we cannot reach by our own efforts, that it's only by the grace of God that we're given this capacity then to order our, our deepest desires as human beings. And I think one of the reasons that he spent so much time emphasizing it is that Desire is such a, an essential part of the spiritual life and for our lives as human beings that without desire we wouldn't have this capacity to love uh, God, God, let alone others in the way that we sh should want to. And so it's only in ordering this love, er ordering eros, desire, that we're able to really seek out virtue, desire virtue, desire God in, in the way that we would want to. And so Cassian uh, really lays it out and says this, this is where we have to uh, engage in the battle most fiercely. And it's interesting, uh, this weekend is the school of St. Philip Neri and we're the focus, the theme for the evening is on chastity. And Philip, as you know, was deeply formed by his reading of Cassian and other Desert Fathers. And it's the same thing, there's this rigor that F Philip sought out chastity in his own life and and also in the way that he taught others to pursue it so much so that he would not hold someone in high esteem in in regards to his uh, reputation for holiness if chastity was lacking because he saw it as something so essential uh, in the pursuit of the other virtues so these are very important I think for us to understand but I think also for our, our generation that has sort of set chastity and the love of that virtue aside, not seeing it as significant as something maybe archaic or having to do with a negative view of the human person. And it's just when you read through Cassian, you get a sense it's just the opposite. They have such a high vision of the human person and uh, such a respect for the power of desire that they emphasize it so much that Cassian goes into it with such great detail. It's almost shocking at times. He understands the working of the human mind and the, the struggle 
with chastity so deeply that uh, it might be even a little a bit embarrassing when we <laughs> get, get to it, at least for the reader it will be. <laughs> so, okay. Any comments before we move on, though? Okay. All right, so we're picking up on page 409, and we've already gone through the translator's introduction. And this is the conference, as I said, on perfection. Section 1. Where you're living in a snobium in Syria, and after an initial training in the faith, had gradually and increasingly begun to desire a greater grace of perfection, we at once decided to go to Egypt, and after having penetrated the remote desert of the Thebaid, to visit many of the holy ones, whose reputation had made them glorious everywhere, if not for the sake of imitating them, then at least for the sake of becoming acquainted with them. Therefore, having completed our voyage, we came to an Egyptian town named Thanesis. Its inhabitants are so surrounded by the sea and by salt swamps that because there is no land, they have devoted themselves to commerce alone and get their wealth and substance from sea trade. Indeed, when they want to build houses, there is no land unless it be brought from, a far, from far away in boats. When we arrived there, God looked with favor on our desires and arranged a meeting with the most blessed and excellent man, Bishop Archibius, who had been snatched from a community of anchorites and given as bishop to the town of Pamphesus. So strictly did he maintain his chosen orientation towards solitude his whole life through that he relaxed nothing of his former humble bearing nor was he flattered by the honor that had accrued to him. He used to declare that he had been admitted to this office as one who was unfit for it, and he would complain that he had been expelled from the anchorite life as unworthy because he had remained in it for 37 years and was utterly unable to achieve the purity demanded by such a profession. When he was in the aforesaid Thinesis, then where the process of electing a bishop had brought him, he received us kindly and very hospitably, being aware of our desire to search out the Holy Fathers even in the furthest reaches of Egypt. Come, he said, and visit for a while the elders who dwell not far from our monastery, whose old age and holiness in bodies now bent over shine so brightly in their faces that the mere sight of them is able to teach a great deal to those who gaze upon them. From them you shall learn not so much by words as by the very example of a holy life, what I regret that I have let slipped and I am unable to teach because I have already lost it. But I believe that my lack will be somewhat compensated for by my zeal if as you look upon the gospel pearl which I myself do not have, I at least point out to you where you can more easily acquire it. So from them you shall learn not so much by words, but by their example. And again, again this is something important to think about, that we are a very wordy kind of culture. And uh, in our speaking about the spiritual life, we can be that way too. And even, I think, when we consider bearing witness to our faith to others, it's often in the context of words or talking about specific doctrines, what it is that we believe more than the example of our lives. So we would bear witness to Christ and to our faith by the holiness of our lives or by the way that we love each other or, or love others. And uh, so the point here is, is well taken. It's the example of the holy life that speaks most powerfully. Taking his staff and satchel then, as is the custom there with all monks who set out on a journey, he himself, acting as our guide, brought us to his city, that is, to Pamphesus. Its lands, and indeed the greater part of the neighboring region, which was once very rich, since, as the report goes, everything was furnished for the royal table from it, 
had been overrun by the sea when it was sh shaken by a sudden earthquake. The villages were all destroyed, and the once fertile lands were so covered with salt marshes that one would think that what is sung spiritually in the psalm was a little literal prophecy about that region. He turned rivers into a desert and springs of water into thirsty ground, a fruitful land into a salty waste for the wickedness of those who dwell in it. In these places and in this way, then, the inundation made islands, as it were, of many towns located on high outcroppings that their inhabitants had fled from. These offer a longed-for retreat for holy solitaries, and on them lived three old men who were very old anchorites, n namely Chiron, Nesteros, and Joseph. The blessed Archibius wanted to take us first to Chiron, both because he was nearer to his monastery and because he was older than the other two. For since he was more than a hundred years old, active only in spirit, his back was so bent with age and with constant prayer that he went about with his hands down and touching the ground as if he had returned to his earliest infancy. As we gazed upon his remarkable face and bearing, for although all his members were already weak and dying, he had never laid aside the severity of his past strictness and humbly asked for a word and a teaching, declaring that our desire for spiritual instruction had been the only reason for our coming. He sighed deeply and said, how can I give you any teaching when the feebleness of, of old age has slackened my former severity and likewise destroyed my confidence in speaking? For how could I presume to teach what I myself do not do? Or should I instruct another person in what I know that I do less of or more lukewarmly? Hence, I have allowed none of the younger men to live with me at this point in my life, lest someone else's strictness be slackened by my example. For the authority of the instructor will be valueless unless he has fastened it in his hearer's heart by what he himself has achieved. So again, emphasizing the example as being the important element here that they instruct the most, not so much by their words, but by the discipline of their, their lives. And you're probably picking up, at least I hope so, the emphasis again on desire. You know, it's our desire that brought us here, that this is the driving element for Germanus and Cassian a desire for holiness, for an understanding of the, the path that leads to it. Considerably surprised, we responded thus to these, to these words. It is true that the roughness of this place and the solitary life, which even a robust young man could barely tolerate, should be enough for all our instruction. And they do instruct us quite abundantly and strike us with compunction, even when you say nothing. Yet we ask you to break your silence a little and instead deign to fill us with those things by which we may be able to embrace more by admiration than by imitation the virtue that we see in you. For even if that lukewarmness of ours which has been revealed to you does not deserve to obtain what we are looking for, at least the effort of such a long journey should obtain it. It was for this that we hastened here from our initial training in the Cenobium at Bethlehem during our instruction and seeking our own progress. So there's delicacy in the, in the exchange between them. You know, the old man acknowledging that at this point his feebleness perhaps might make him less of a teacher and they, they being gentle in their response, you know, you know Beseech, beseech him to teach him them nonetheless that you know, that they already admire the fact that he's lived in such such a place and and that they've the desire has driven them here and so perhaps he would be willing to to uh, respond to them then the blessed Chiron said there are three things that restrain people from vice namely the fear of Gehenna or of present laws or hope and desire for the kingdom of heaven. 
or a disposition for the good itself and a love of virtue. For we read that fear detests the contagion of evil. The fear of the Lord hates wickedness. Hope, too, prevents the incursion of any vice, for all who hope in him shall not fail. Love also dreads the destruction of sin, because love never fails. And again, love covers a multitude of sins. Therefore, the blessed apostle includes the entire sum of salvation in the perfection of these three virtues, saying, Now there abide faith, hope, love, these three. For it is faith that through dread of future judgment and punishment makes us refrain from the contagion of vice. Hope that calling our minds away from the things present despises all the pleasures of the body and waits for heavenly rewards. Love that inflaming us mentally with love of Christ and with the fruit of spiritual virtue makes us utterly despise whatever is contrary to those things. Although these three seem to tend to one end, inasmuch as they move us to abstain from what is unlawful, nonetheless they differ from one another by considerable degrees of excellence. For the first two belong properly to those who are tending toward perfection and have not yet acquired a love of virtue, but the third belongs particularly to God and to those who have received in themselves the image and likeness of God. For only he does what is good, who is moved not by fear or by hope of reward, but by a disposition for the good alone. As Solomon says, the Lord has done all things for himself. For the sake of his own goodness, he bestows an abundance of every good thing on the worthy and the unworthy, because he can neither be wearied by wrongdoing nor disturbed by human wickedness. He always abides perfectly good and by nature unchangeable. And so th this will be the theme that sort of runs throughout the, the rest of the conference, that the, the goal of, of perfection in, in love is that we move to that point that we come to desire virtue for itself, that we aren't moved by our fear of, of punishment or even that hope of reward, as he says, but simply for the love of God and the love of the virtue itself, that we've been freed and detached from anything that w is worldly in the sense that it would draw us away from that virtue. And we can be driven and motivated simply by our desire for God. And it's there that we come to resemble God the most and are perfected most by his grace that we take on that image and likeness. God certainly isn't driven by fear or hope of reward. He's driven only by love. And it's an extraordinary thing to think about. Uh, it might seem simple to us reading this or quite familiar, but the idea that you know, we can be motivated purely by love in our lives and that we are driven because we see the beauty of it and we have a desire uh, to embrace it and to please God above all, all things, that this is something that is possible for us by the grace of God. And, you know, this is often lost in the spiritual life. People can become so disheartened by their struggles with particular sins or their attraction to sin that the idea of being able to uh, come to this point in life, to be transformed by the grace of God, to love virtue so much that we would want nothing to do with sin at all, seems too remote. And so it's important to, to bring before ourselves again and again that this is something that we are called to and that is something that is willed by God and also something that he provides us the grace to live. You will be perfect as my heavenly father is perfect, that this is something that God wills for us. And so we should have uh, not only this vague hope that it's a possibility, but even a kind of surety, a boldness in that faith, that this is something that God wills for us and if God wills it, then it is most certainly 
a possibility, not because of anything that we would do, although the human element is essential in this, but that the weight lies on God and the grace that he provides. And we simply have to give ourselves over to it more and more fully. And it's a hard thing, I think, when a person perhaps has struggled for decades with uh, particular sins to imagine that and not give up hope in, in striving to, to live the holy life and that they might give up hope in trusting in themselves alone that they w what would happen is that the, the, they would be uh, more fully given over to the grace of God, that they would understand with a greater clarity that what is needed is this complete abandonment and surrender to God's grace, that this is where the, the victory is won. And it's then that the real transformation begins to take place. All the ascetical activities are meant to lead to that reality, that we abandon ourselves completely over to the grace of God and allow ourselves to be transformed from glory to glory until that image and likeness comes to perfection within us. Okay. Anything on what the elder says here so far? It's this that he'll develop with greater clarity throughout the conference. <laughs> Yes. A couple of tremendous kind of questions. Mm -hmm. You know what? <clears throat> he says that the first two, fear and hope, are those tending towards perfection, not not required a love of virtue, right? And the third belongs particularly to God, to those who have received in themselves the image and likeness of God. That we're created in the image and likeness of God. Right? And when we're baptized, that to some level is. I'm not sure what the right words are, but that's uh, clean and enhanced sacramentally. How do you receive the image and likeness of God yet again? Of course, he's, he's, that's what he says in the, the third belongs particularly to God, to those, and to those who have received in themselves the image and likeness of God. It makes it sound like it's reaching a point or another event it's not common to well, the first two. The reality is, is that we allow, allow that image and likeness to be sullied, you know, through our, our sinfulness. And so have to bring ourselves back again and again through repentance and compunction to embrace the life that God has made possible for us. That this indeed is the will of God. This is how we've been created. But on some level, we've set it aside. We've chosen lesser things for ourselves. And it's these theological virtues, those that have God as their end, that are particularly important for us. So then you know, faith, love. hope, and love all have God as the end for us. You know, the, that's what we are seeking in them. And the greatest of them is love, that the two, even those two others that have God as then will eventually fall away. What endures unto eternity is, is love. And so even in this life that when perfected by the grace of God, we can reach that point that we are driven by the greatest of them, which is, is love of God and of virtue itself that we see everything in and through that lens. And he develops this more and more fully that, you know, we become sons in the sun, that there's a kind of not only perfection and virtue that takes place, but already now this intimacy with Christ, we become one with him. And so begin to share fully then in the, you know, the treasures of the, the kingdom itself. You know, we become heirs in the air and begin to experience the fruit of that even now. And so I think that's why, you know, when you have, they say just looking at these men was enough to stir the desire for God 
or you know to bring about a greater desire for conversion you know that they radiate the glory of God and this is you know I think what part of what we've lost in the sense of orthodoxy you know it's not just right teaching right doctrine doxa is glory so it's right glory and so what you know we manifest our orthodoxy our right faith our right belief in the life that we are living this is what speaks most fully to who we are as christians when we've been transformed by the grace of god when his glory shines forth through us this is the most powerful thing you know there are quotes that i've put on from elders on the internet that talk about this you know don't don't argue with people about the faith you know love them and people get really bent out of shape by that because there is this sense that well don't we have to speak explicitly about the faith or defend the faith you know there's a real uh, discomfort with the idea that love is powerful enough to change the hearts of enemies even you know to the bring you know speaks more clearly of the truth than our limited words if we're animated by a divine love then that love shining forth through us and through our actions is going to speak more clearly about the truth of our faith than anything that we could ever say and there's part of us that doesn't believe that because we, there's a resistance that we struggle with. We want it to be about that. It's much easier to argue about our faith online, or especially, but argue about our faith than to really live it. To be completely surrendered to God in every way is much more threatening to us on a psychological and spiritual level than arguing with somebody about it. You know, to be humble before another, to even allow ourselves to be ridiculed and mocked, you know, is much harder. You know, we could talk about humility, you know, but to bear witness, you know, to it through actually living it, to be, to be Christ-like is far more challenging. Especially in a day and age like ours, where the faith is attacked daily on every level where Christians are being martyred you know to you know bear witness to this love of enemies when people would sooner you know drop a bomb on the Middle East you know to be done with it you know it's much harder to you know live in the vulnerability of love when Christians are being attacked Apologetics aren't always the way to go. Well, it's not that there isn't a place. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we can, you know, and we should take those opportunities and opportune moments to, you know, articulate the faith clearly and to the best of our ability. In fact, we're required to do so, that within the limits of our capacities to articulate the faith with as much clarity as we can. But, you know, we don't want to turn the faith into, you know, mere teaching or doctrines. Christianity is about Christ, the person of Christ. And the way that we bear witness to him is by following him and living. You know, take up your cross daily. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute. These are all the ways that we bear witness to it most fully. And so, you know, there is a place for it, but I think the problem is, is that we put it center stage rather than where it should exist. I can go back to mm -hmm. for my yeah, next question. Um, I think 
the, the language that Carmung uses here, um, specifically in that uh, first paragraph in 412. Mm -hmm. The third belongs particularly to God and to those who have received in themselves the image and likeness of God. I've been thinking um, about the sacraments a lot lately and just thinking about the sacraments being um, the place where God gives all of himself. Right. There's nothing that God withholds from us in the sacraments. He gives everything. Right. Um, so that is given. But with regards to reception, there is a question of my heart, the, the state of my heart and my soul as to how much of that grace I can actually receive. Mm -hmm. And so for Chiron making this distinction, not necessarily of you know, of how much God is giving, but in how much we are able to receive. Um, it makes sense that there would be those who have not moved beyond faith and hope. Mm -hmm. They've they've held God just a little bit more at a distance. Right. Um, but that there are those who have opened up such a portal in their hearts mm -hmm. that they have received totally right. what God has given, and have thus being conformed to that image and likeness right. that God has given them in their baptism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's sort of like that story from the fathers, you know, why not become fire yeah. and lifting up his hands and having them all become, his fingers being torches. And, you know, that's a person who's transformed, mm -hmm. you know, by the grace of God in an extraordinary way. That his, uh, his young disciple was living a holy life but hadn't, you know, imagined that or hadn't, you know, come to conceive of the spiritual life as being consumed by the love of God to such an extent that our whole being then is trans transformed by the f fire of God's love. And you know, I, I think he's probably not speaking so much of the sacraments here. I think he's talking more about who have been transformed by the grace of God so f fully. You know, it probably has a mind, although certainly I think the, the sacraments would have been there too, but just the way that it's being used here, I have the sense that... But uh, I'm glad you brought it up because it does emphasize, though, that it is more by the grace of God than the ascetical efforts. One of the the teachings of Philip Neary is that, you know, without the Eucharist, chastity is an impossibility. That it's only by receiving that perfect and pure love of Christ then that we have the capacity to love perfectly and purely. And so we prepare ourselves as much as possible through the ascetic life and in our generous response so that we might receive that grace fully and have it bear the fullest amount of uh, fruit, but it's only by receiving that that grace that we have the possibility to love as God loves. Okay, should we move on? Section seven. If a person is tending to perfection then, he will mount from that first degree of fear, which we have properly designated as servile, and about which it is said, when you have done everything, say, we are useless slaves, to the higher level of hope, progressing by a degree. Here, the comparison is not with a slave, but with a hireling, because now the person looks forward to the payment of a wage, and is, as it were, untroubled by the absolution of his sins and the fear of punishment, and is conscious of his own good works. Although he seems to strive for a reward for what is pleasing, still he is unable to attain to the disposition of a son who trusts in the generosity of his father's indulgence and who has no doubt that everything which belongs to his father is his. Has no doubt that everything which belongs to his father is his. You know, to get to this point in the spiritual life that we have full confidence in the love of God and the promises of God. So to live not as a slave or as a hireling, but as son. 
To this, even the prodigal, who had abandoned even the name of son, along with his father's property, did not dare to aspire when he said, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. For after he had denied taking his fill uh, of the husk of the swine, that is, of the filthy food of vice, he reflected upon himself and was struck with compunction by a solitary fear. And he began to loathe the uncleanness of the swine and to dread the pains of dire hunger. Having become like a slave, he thought now <coughs> of a wage and desired the status of a hireling, saying, how many of my father's hirelings have an abundance of bread, and here I am perishing of hunger. I will return therefore to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hirelings. But his father, hurrying to meet him, accepted these words of humble repentance with a love greater than that with which he had been sp they had been spoken. Not content to grant him less, he passed over the other two degrees without delay and restored him to his former dignity of sonship. So this is what's so important about repentance. You know, it's, Christ does not want us to be slaves or mere hirelings, but now I call you, you friends or and for us, it would be sons in the sons. That what's desired for us is the fullness. You know, not that, that we would have to take up a lesser position. Hence, we also, mounting by the indissoluble grace of love to the third degree of sons, who believe that everything which belongs to their father is theirs, must strive to be worthy of receiving the image and likeness of the heavenly father, and of being able to proclaim in imitation of the true Son, all that the Father has is mine. The blessed apostle also declares this about us when he says, all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the world or, or life or death, or things present or things to come, all things are yours. The commands of the Savior call us to this likeness as well. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. For a disposition for the good is sometimes cut off in people when the mind's vigor has been slackened by lukewarmness or joy or pleasure, which removes either the fear of Gehenna in the present or the desire for things to come. There is in those things, to be sure, a certain measure of progress that draws us on so that in the beginning to resist vice through fear of punishment or the hope of reward, we may come to the degree of love. As it is said, there is no fear in love, but perfect love cast out fear. Since fear has punishment, the one who fears is not perfect in love. Therefore, let us love because God has first loved us. We shall then be unable to mount to that true perfection unless just as he first loved us for no other reason than our salvation, we also love him for no other reason than sheer love of him. Hence, we must strive to mount in perfect ardor of mind from this fear of hope and from hope to love of God and the love of virtue itself, so that we may attain to a disposition for the good itself and to the extent possible to human nature, hold firmly to what is good. So, you know, the more we progress in the spiritual life, the less we should be driven by fear and anxiety. There should be no anxiety in us whatsoever. You know, if we believe that everything is ours now in and through Christ, that all that belongs to him in union with the Father, belongs to us as well. And so even in our struggles and our poverty, you know, we, we should not give ourselves over to despondency or, or anxiety, but seek through repentance to enter in, you know, to that relationship again, confident that we will be received as the Father received the prodigal son. Mm -hmm. I think I mean, one of the things that I noticed 
this is reading this is that he doesn't altogether kind of eclipse of faith and hope. I mean, they're certainly included in there, mm -hmm. but definitely a lot of stress is on the love of virtue itself, and the mm -hmm. love of God as its own as its, as its own good. But um, I mean, to what extent do you think? Could, I know, in reading some of the other fathers, there's a you know that. Some of, sometimes the remedy to sin is fear of Gehenna. Right. You know, and things. So, as as children, as children of God, to what extent must we go through faith, hope, and hope in order to reach love? Or is there that just, you know, you repent and immediately kind of enter into that kind of sonship, right? And receive the total love of Christ. And um, I think it depends upon the individual and the grace of God given, you know, the wisdom of God. Because look at Mary Magdalene, you know, that there is this profound experience of the mercy of God. And there's not even, you know, uh, an expression of repentance there at that point. Which she's dragged out into the town square and is going to be stoned to death. And, you know, but what she ex experiences is instead the profound mercy of God. And there's something there that changes her life forever. You know, that there's a movement away from a former way of life now to be focused completely upon Christ that she is, falls in love with Christ, you know, and the mercy shown. And so, and I think we see this, you know, then throughout the gospel, you know, just how powerful that was for her and what vision that opened her up to, you know, even to, to at the end, you know, when it's thought that all that was destroyed go, going to the tomb uh, to anoint the body even though the tomb's been sealed. That she goes anyways. She's driven solely by love. And so, you know, we see there, you know, this profound experience and encounter that transforms her, you know, in deep measure. Whereas with some of the others, we see more of a struggle to do that. Maybe the beloved disciple, too. You know, he's driven by a kind of love to the, the tomb as well. Peter's, you know, laboring, but John's driven and doesn't go in because Christ isn't there, but believes. You know. So in an instant, I think God can transform an individual, you know, in, in his wisdom and, and depending on how that, the person embraces, how open they are their grace and she, she may have known the great poverty you know of her existence or or just have been so struck by the, the depth of the mercy there that it brought about a radical openness but you know there in others, I think there can be this such a strong attraction to the things of this world that you know, sometimes it has to be that fear, you know, that they are, you know, become aware of what could be lost you know, in their state of life if they stay along that same line of life and. I guess I was just thinking, you know, I was thinking about a child, like for myself, mm -hmm. even growing up, mm -hmm. having, you know, in, in, in the face of having done something wrong, you know, fearing my dad mm -hmm. would come home to find out from my mom, right. you know, and having that fear. But um, 
but that was always followed by an expression of, of love right. from a dad. Yeah. Um, to where, you know, even thinking of my my parents training me to to do good by offering me a reward. Mm -hmm. But that these things, you know, by the time I was a you know a teenager, you know, come of age and become mm -hmm. an adult, you know, kind of fall away. Right. And that love is there. Mm -hmm. There's that there's a beauty to that kind of progression. Right. And yet, but some people do get stuck in the fear, mm -hmm. and they never, they never right. come to... Yeah, where well, that's been ingrained yeah. in one way or another, yeah. you know, by explicit teaching about God as being, you know, the punisher mm -hmm. and one who's looking to punish rather than to be merciful, mm -hmm. or that they experience that in and through the traumatic relationship when, that they have with the, the parents themselves, you know, that they, they are God to them in some way, and the first image of love or lack of love. And so if that is deeply ingrained, you know, to have this fear, then, you know, making that movement to be able to have that radical trust and vulnerability before God might take, might be a longer journey. Or ha they have to have something there that then frees them liberates them from that experience. That often the great conversions take place through illness, where a person is brought up to the edge of death, you know, and then they come to see reality with a greater clarity. Now, obviously, you know, fear had, that probably had a big part of that. You know, they, you know, come to see their own mortality, or they come in that moment to see their own lack of faith, and out of that experience, you know, then you know, go through a certain kind of conversion that draws them further along into hope and then ultimately to love. But I think what's good here is what he puts before us, you know, is the thing that would ultimately be desired. Not that the others are unimportant or, or that we don't have to make our way through them. But you can see he's almost making a point here that people can get stuck if they lose sight of this greater call. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you have a thought? No. No? Okay. Are we on number six mm -hmm. here? Okay. Uh, yes. Me. Huh? Yeah, I think you already said that. We're on eight. We are on eight, eight. Oh, okay, section eight. Yes. There is a great difference between the person who puts out the fire of vice in himself through the fear of Gehenna or through the hope of future reward and the person who dreads wickedness and impurity because he is disposed toward the divine love and who holds to the good solely out of love of purity and a desire for chastity not looking to a promised future reward, but delighting in his awareness of the present good and doing everything out of a pleasure in virtue rather than with an eye toward punishment. The condition can neither misuse, this condition can neither misuse an opportunity to sin when no human witnesses are present, nor be defiled by hidden thoughts of pleasure since inasmuch as it holds inwardly to a disposition for the virtuous itself, it not only does not accept in its heart whatever is contrary to this, but even looks upon it with the greatest abhorrence. Beautiful vision, you know, that even in the hidden recesses of the heart, a person being freed from any attraction to sin and even having, you know, a certain kind of abhorrence for it. For it is one thing for a person who is delighted by a present good to hate the contagions of vice and of the flesh, and another thing for him to refrain from unlawful desires through an awareness of future reward. One thing for him to fear present loss, and another thing for him to dread the punishment to come. Finally, it is far greater not to wish to depart from the good because of goodness itself, 
than not to consent to evil because of fear of evil. For in the former the good is willed, whereas in the latter it is, as it were, coerced and violently forced out of someone who is unwilling, whether by fear of punishment or by desire for rewards. For the person who resists the blandishments of vice by reason of fear will return to what he loves when the obstacle of fear has been removed, and consequently he will not attain to constant steadfastness in good. On the contrary, he will never be free of attack, because he will not possess the firm and unceasing peace of purity. For where battles rage, there cannot be the danger of wounds as well cannot but be the danger of wounds as well. Whoever is placed in conflict must occasionally be grazed by the enemy's sword, even if he is a warrior and fighting bravely and frequently inf inf inflicts deadly wounds on his adversaries. But the person who has overcome the onslaught of vice, who now enjoys a secure peace and has passed to a disposition for the virtuous itself, will hold constantly to that state of goodness which now possesses him entirely, because he believes that nothing is more damaging than damage done to inner chastity. To inner chastity. You know, so chastity is not only this kind of bodily purity. You know, it is uh, rooted in a love a virtue and wanting nothing to, to damage that whatsoever. For he to whom the wicked transgression of virtue and the poisonous contagion of vice itself are a serious punishment does not consider anything dearer or more precious than the present purity. In his case, I say, awareness of the presence of another human being does not add anything to his goodness, nor does solitude detract from it. Rather, always and everywhere, he bears about within himself as his witness the consciousness not only of his deeds, but also of his thoughts, and he strives above all to please it, which he knows that he cannot cheat or deceive or escape from. So hardly a worldly view of life. You know, this is to, to love virtue above all things and to have this as the constant focus of our attention and desire that we would constantly be, as it were, love would, in the vision of love, would constantly have us be scanning, you know, what we are engaged in and how we are engaged in seeking for ways to love and please God and to do his will. And it, it isn't even as if that is something that has to be, you know, uh, violently pushed. You know, it's the, the desire there is so great that that's what one seeks out. You know, we're not engaged in, in the battle, as it were, anymore. Because to be engaged in the battle sh reveals some kind of attraction still to what we are fighting. It's a curious thing. You know, when you have love for God and have eyes only for God, you're not even going to notice the enemies around. You know, so long as we're focused in fighting and having to engage in that fight, you know, our hearts don't belong only to God. When they do, you know, whatever befalls or afflicts us, you know, doesn't move us or make us lose you know, sight of him. You remember the story of those monks when they're out walking and they come along a woman and the one picks up the woman and carries her across the stream or something like that. And the others are scandalized for like miles down the road. And then finally they get so angry that they rail at this guy. And he says, well, you know, I picked her up and carried her for a few moments. And you've been carrying her for the last <laughs> two hours. You know, that for one whose heart is pure, you know, they're not going to be moved by that. You know, they'll, you know, pick up the woman and carry her across the, you know, they're not going to be you know, 
What's that? Focused on it. Right. Yeah. Because there's not the disorder, disordered desire there. They're, you know, see the person in need. Whereas the fact that the others were so disturbed by that, that it, it betrays a kind of fear still within them. A fear that is rooted in the fact that they know that they still have this kind of disordered desire within themselves. If they, if they were to do that, it would endanger them. Where are we here? Nine. Inner chastity, right? Oh, no, a nine. Nine. Oh, the last line is very captivating. He strives above all to please it, which he knows that he cannot cheat or deceive or escape it. That, you know, we can play these spiritual and mental games with our, ourselves. You know, we can tr try to cheat <laughs> in the spiritual life. You know, we rationalize and do all these ki kinds of things, tell ourselves, oh, it's not that bad, or, you know, and whereas, you know, a person who's been transformed by grace to this extent, you know, knows, can see through all, all those ways that we would try to cheat. And so, you know, doesn't even attempt, attempt them. You know, who are you folding, you know, at that point? If by God's help and not relying on his own laborious effort, anyone deserves to possess this state, he will begin to pass from the condition of a slave in which there is fear and from a hireling's hopeful desire in which it is not so much the goodness of the giver, but rather the payment of a wage that is looked for, to adopted sonship, where there is no longer any fear or greed, but rather that love, that love which never fails and always abides. Concerning this fear and love, the Lord, the Lord reproves some and shows them what is appropriate to each person. A son honors his father and a slave fears his master. But if I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? For a slave must fear, because if he knows the will of his master and does what is worthy of stripes, he shall be badly beaten. And so whoever attains by way of this love to the image and likeness of God will take delight in the good, because of the pleasure in the good itself, since he likewise possesses a similar disposition of patience and mildness, he will no longer be angered by the vices of sinners. On the contrary, with sorrow and compassion, he will beg pardon for their frailty, remembering that he himself was for a long time assailed by the urges of similar passions until he was saved by the Lord's pity. He will realize that since he was not freed from assaults of the flesh by his own effort, but was saved by the protection of God, it is not wrath, but mercy, which must be shown to those in error. And he will repeat this verse to God with utter tranquility of heart. You have broken my chains. To you will I offer a sacrifice of praise. And unless the Lord had helped me, my soul would soon have dwelt in hell. Possessing this humility of mind, he will also be able to fulfill the gospel command of perfection. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you, pray for those who persecute, persecute and calumniate you. Thus, we shall deserve to attain to that concomitant reward by which we shall not only manifest the image and likeness of God, but shall also be called his sons, so that you might be, he says, sons of your father who is in heaven who makes his sun rise on the good and the bad, and who reigns on the just and the unjust. The blessed John knew that he had acquired this disposition, and he said that we might have confidence on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we also in this world. For how can a weak and frail human nature be like him unless in peaceful imitation of God it always bestows the love of its own heart on the good and the bad, the just and the unjust. 
Thus it does good out of a disposition towards goodness itself, attaining to that true adoption of the sons of God, about which the same blessed apostle declares, no one who has been born of God commits sin because his seed is in him, and he cannot sin for he has been born of God. And again, we know that no one who has been born of God sins, but his having been begotten by God preserves him and the evil one does not touch him. So to live in such radical communion with Christ, to be sons in the Son, uh, is also then to be untouched by sin, that it loses its attraction for us. Any thoughts or comments? Pretty extraordinary vision of, of the life of the Christian. to the same, perhaps the same repentance thing that the uh, prodigal son, she just gave it all to God. She broke the box open. And so she was so extravagant in her gift that she received unending extravagance back. It wasn't this gradual, tiny little transformation. Does that make sense? Yeah, with this, the story of the prodigal son, we don't know. And, you know, I, th I think when we think about that passage, you know, we the real thing that we have to see is that neither son is pleasing. Because one is acting out of fear. You know, he comes back because he's afraid of dying and starving to death and the other is acting like a hireling you know because he complains you know you when have you given us you know m me and my friends uh you know a calf to have a party with <laughs> you know so he's not acting the the one the one who's truly you know acceptable in the eyes of the father or the one who would be truly pleasing to the father would one who had been with him from the beginning, but also trusted fully in that love, was re truly responsive, who didn't reject him and go away and, you know, live this dissolute life, but not one who stayed there and yet was resentful of the Father, even though the Father had given everything. What we are meant to see as there is the perfect love of the Father, but we also see then the, per the perfect Son is Christ, the one who gives himself completely. And so the, the parable, in a sense, is interpreted and can be only interpreted in and through the cross. I think we, we see it in all its fullness. Who the, We see the perfect mercy of the Father, but also we see what true sonship is. And I, I think what you said about Mary and the breaking of the alabaster jar is right, you know, that she, Christ himself says what she did here, wherever the gospel is preached, what she will, has done here will be told in memory of her. That's not said of anyone else. He says not, nothing like that of anyone else in the, in the gospels. 
But because what she did there was so powerfully expressive of love, of gratitude, you know, of that love of the cross, you know, the out, outpouring of it, you know, not, she breaks it completely. You know, as you said, the aroma fills the room. She's accused of being wasteful. So, all good thoughts. We still have a little while to go here, a few more pages. And then it continues on in the next conference with chastity, you know, that's you know, where he talks about you know, developing this in, internal chastity as well as physical. You know, the one, le the external leads to the other and helps us then come to this point of desiring virtue above all things. Okay, so we'll pick up there next time when we close with the prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God.